Before I start, I thought I would ask you guys a question, okay? How many of you, whether you're in media buying or a creative agency or a consultancy, how many of you are really, really passionate about the industry that you're in? See some hands, right on. You wake up, you're excited, good. This is so good, this is so good. All right, I have a secret to tell you, but it has to stay in the room. I know I run a social media agency, but don't go tweeting this out. I will be very upset. I've been running a social media agency for 10 years, since before there even was a real like thing of social media. And I have very little passion for social media. This is a shocker, right? You all want to hire me now? You know I'm so great at social media? No. The reality is um, that I didn't, and it never really started that way. And so I thought I would share with you why I don't and how I was able to turn my agency into something that benefited those who needed social media and something that I was able to feel passionate about, that I was able to stand behind and say, this is really why I want to get up in the morning. So the reason I wasn't passionate to start, I think was that it was my husband's idea, really. We co-founded the agency. I think we're the only agency ever, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that was founded on a wedding day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Most people are really excited to open their gifts. We were like really excited to start our business. It's pretty crazy. My husband was a larger than life personality and still is. If you think I have a lot of energy, take it and times it by 100 and you've got Dave. He wanted everyone to come to his wedding, and not just people from high school or primary school. He would like, like you in the audience, if you were here today, he'd say, oh my god, you've got to come to my wedding. You've got to come. <laughs> OK, so we knew that there was nowhere that we could hold such a wedding, and there was certainly nowhere that we could afford such a wedding. So we had to get creative. And so we were both big baseball fans, and we pitched a baseball park. We said, we want to get married after a game, and we're going to buy out your night. We're going to sell in sponsors. Normally, games have sponsors in the States, and like Pepsi, in between innings, would toss t-shirts into the audience. Instead, we would have like 1-800-Flowers uh, toss bridal bouquets. It would be wonderful. We'd have a sponsored wedding. We would get married on the field after the game, and we'd also raise money for charity. They thought we were nuts, but we said, OK, we'll try it. Let's do it. We did it. We raised $100,000 in sponsorships, $25,000 for the MS Society, and all of the sponsors who participated got national and international press. So ABC World News Tonight, CNN, The New York Times, you name it, this was talked about everywhere. And so afterwards, the clients all came to us, all these sponsors, and they were like, this was fantastic. You have to do it again. <laughs> again. Again, we are not going to have a sponsored baby. We are not going to have a sponsored divorce. So I guess we'll start a company uh, based on the concept that great ideas fuel word of mouth. We became a word of mouth marketing agency just a few months before Facebook opened beyond the college market. And once again, my husband, quite the personality and also a visionary, said, this is it. Social media is going to be the thing, and we need to jump on it and ride it fast. And I said, OK, I'll do it. Uh, he was the CEO and the visionary, and I was the operator. I was the person who was making sure it was all happening. So it really wasn't my idea to be a social media agency. And at that time, I didn't realize what a social media agency was going to be. First of all, I didn't realize that it was going to be nearly impossible to turn a profit in social media, especially when you were starting out and you were expected to manage communities for giant brands 24-7. This was before they really built out customer service at their own organizations, and a lot of times you know, you'll see an airline has an entire department devoted to this. Back in 2007 or 2008, we were devoted to this running their customer service online around the clock. And if you didn't get back to somebody in a minute, it was a big problem. Pretty hard to be profitable and keep a staff with that. Also, as social media grew, there was a content problem. Every moment, there was a new network with a new type of content that needed to be created. It was really hard to make money. And even though we were one of the fastest growing companies in the US 
for three years after we became the social media agency, it was really hard to turn a profit. Again, a secret, don't tell. It's because I'm amongst my peeps. Okay, <laughs> the last piece that drove me crazy about social media, and Dave actually loved, was that social media agency leaders were really loud and talking about themselves all day on social media. They were either telling you to crush it. Do you guys know crush it? Yeah, no? Well, perhaps you don't, but if you go online and look, you'll see a lot of agency leaders talking about all of these, you know, oh, you gotta win, you gotta go, you gotta And that was not me. The other thing about social media that drove me crazy was this. Every single social media leader out there had to sit and take selfies of themselves all the time speaking. Look, like this, like this. Hey guys, I'm speaking, look at this crowd, it's so great, yay! To be a successful leader, you had to put yourself out there. And even though I look to you like I'm quite comfortable putting myself out there, the reality is that on the inside I was not, and I felt very, very exposed. Fortunately, Dave was more than happy to assume that role. Except in 2012, Dave once again had a vision and saw that technology was going to be as important or if not more important than agencies. And it certainly was a very interesting way to make money. They were getting crazy multiples at that time. And so Dave started a technology company and I became the CEO of Likeable Media, an agency for which I was terrified and didn't have a ton of passion for. And by the way, there was one other big problem. I have another question for you. How many of you have social media in your offerings in some capacity? Social media? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. In 2012, it was not 2007. 2007, we were the only game in town and we were experts. In 2012, there wasn't a company around, not a single agency that didn't say that they knew social media, even if they didn't, as well as we did. Everybody did social media. Was there still a need for a social media agency? <sighs> so I sat there and thought to myself, what's a girl to do? And I ended up doing three things that reinvented the agency and helped me find my passion and helped our agency grow tenfold. The first thing that I did was I thought about what I actually liked about social media. Here's what I liked. I liked that there was an unbelievable ability to listen that I could see how people felt about a brand. There was so much data out there, not just even what they thought about a brand and what they were tweeting, but how they spoke, how they felt. I could get all of that from social media. Social media is so rich in data. It's all out there. And yet, with all that listening, there are very few people who are taking that and truly turning it into insight. I thought if I could create something that was scalable and repeatable and had the ability to turn that insight into something, I could win. And so I invented something called Content Cubed. It was a three-step process. We would curate, first listen, then we would create based off of our listening. We know this is going to perform better because, and then we would connect it. We would use social advertising, which I knew would be a very important piece of the puzzle. We would use influencer marketing, and we would use organic placement on new and emerging networks. If we did that and only that, and we did it better than everyone else, and we said no to anything else, then I thought we might be able to not only have something really interesting and different and not only be seen as experts, but we might be able to control our profitability. Speaking of controlling profitability, I knew that companies like Johnson & Johnson and all of these big guys were calling me in and saying, Carrie, we're being told to reinvent the agency model. We don't want to pay by the hour anymore. These services, we're getting squeezed left and right. Entire procurement departments are dedicated to figuring out how they can pay us less. Really. And so I decided that if I thought of an interesting way to restructure our payment model, Maybe I could make more money and make those guys look like rock stars. Hmm. So I started something called the content credit system. Every piece of content at our company equates to a certain number of credits. Instead of an hourly rate, 
and instead of a monthly retainer, clients subscribe to a monthly number of credits. Every month, we allocate those credits based on need and what's happening in the marketplace. That means when Snapchat launches its self-serve ad platform, as it did just a week ago, we're able to very quickly launch a big Snapchat strategy without having to go back and say, oh, it's going to be this much, this many hours for this piece of content. It's going to be this much for this. Because they have the credit system, they're able to know that we are allocating their dollars in the best way possible. We took that credit system and we built in the strategy and we built in the ad placement. Not only did it increase our profitability and help us become a healthy agency with margins uh, that were not only respectable but actually good, it helped us differentiate in a time where people were looking for a fresh new look. Finally, the last thing, you know, I mentioned to you how Dave was such a great leader and how these guys are telling me to crush it all the time, and I felt really psyched out. And I was thinking, am I, why am I so psyched out? I don't get it. I guess it's because it's like a whole me, me, me thing, and I'm much more comfortable telling the story of other people. So one day I was in the shower, and I was singing, because I love Beyonce. And I was singing to myself a little, all the social ladies. You guys all know, all the single ladies. I blew the line for you. All the single ladies. And I thought to myself, um, hey, all the single ladies, all the social ladies. And I was like, all the social ladies, maybe. I could start a podcast. And I decided to start a podcast that was actually entirely selfish. It wasn't about getting an audience. It really wasn't even about a podcast. I wanted to call up women who were decision makers at brands in social media. I wanted to say, hey, I want to interview you. Hey, there's this whole really loud male narrative on social media. And has anyone ever asked you about your story? Has anyone ever asked you about your challenges in social media? Well, they all came on, because who doesn't want a little PR? They all told me about all their challenges in social media. They all told me what they were looking to do the next year. And I formed a relationship with all of them. So who do you think they called when they needed social media help? Me. <laughs> OK, they called me. Um, so it was pretty great. <laughs> um, what I found about this story was something that I find across stories that I hear from interviewing hundreds of women, coming out with a book in December called Work It, which is all about how women work their way around different things a little bit differently, thinking about how we think differently, like Beck said earlier. Um, so when I've interviewed them, what I've found is that if you take what you hate, what really pisses you off about your, ag your agency, your industry, your anything, you're able to say, hey, if I look at a solution for that, chances are other people hate that too. If I hated hourly and going through hours and all of that, other people might hate that too. If I hated that it was a loud male narrative, other women might hate that too. And so when you're looking at something that you need to reinvent, I would encourage you to just look at yourself and think about what you don't like about your industry and how you might be able to reinvent it. Thank you. <laughs>